Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, well, it's a small meeting, but it doesn't matter. I'm always uh, happy to, to share my work with all the colleagues. So it's, um, it, it's very nice. Uh, thank you, Andy. Also, I, I don't know if Andy is here, but thank you, Andy, for the invitation. And thank you, Stacy, for the, for the very nice uh, introduction. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to be here. And so just to, as, uh, Stance, uh, as uh, Stacy mentioned, I'm a sociologist of, uh, an ethnographer, actually, of science and technology. And usually I do uh, ethnographic and very down-to-earth uh, descriptive uh, research. But today I will do something a little bit more theoretical. So it's still based uh, on my observations, on the observations I made during my different uh, fieldwork. But overall, the, the talk will mostly uh, consider theoretical matters, and it will uh, also propose a, a bunch of uh, theoretical notions. So I really hope it, it won't be too wild. But uh, when it's the fly high seminar, so I guess it's also the aim of the, of the seminar to talk about uh, high level of stuff. So th this, this uh, talk will be very high level. And so you can see the title here, uh, On Ground Truth Biases and Morality in Machine Learning Design and Application. So obviously it's just, the title is just a list of some of the things I, I will talk about. But perhaps more uh, importantly, oh, sorry, I just need to, yeah, there you go. More, important, more importantly, I think, um, it's important to know that this talk is based on the paper I recently published uh, at Big Data and Society. So uh, of course, if you want to go deeper into the topic, you can also, you can also check the paper and uh, well, actually, I was surprised that the manuscript was accepted and published that quickly because the, the topic is a bit strange and I thought it would be much longer. So I find myself uh, now talking about a, a text that is already published, which is a bit problematic. But still, again, if you, if you want more precisions, you can, of course, ask me questions at the end of the, of the talk, but you can also uh, access the, the paper at the Big Data and Society uh, website. And well, I will just start with a few words of uh, introduction just to frame the, the overall topic, maybe. So the, the paper uh, and the presentation deals with uh, what is nowadays called uh, machine learning algorithms, which are uh, things that, are, that can be described in very broad strokes as uh, computer, computerized methods that infer calculation rules from sets of data in order to make uh, predictions and uh, eventually support uh, decision making uh, tasks. And for many reasons that are very complicated, actually, but for many reasons, these uh, specific algorithms are now uh, more and more called uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. And in, well, this talk and the paper deals precisely with uh, these entities. And as you, uh, as you maybe know, uh, machine learning algorithms are now integral part of uh, many commonly uh, used devices, well, like web search engines, uh, social media applications, or surveillance uh, systems, for, for instance. And uh, in reaction to the growing ubiquity of these calculation uh, methods, uh, many scholars of uh, science and technology studies have accounted for uh, some of their uh, constitutive relationships, as I call them. So they have described some of the things that contribute to the existence of machine learning algorithms. And this area of study is also called uh, critical data studies or critical studies of AI. And on the, on the slide, you have a bunch of, uh, of I believe, important uh, references in, in that field. But what's important uh, for my case is that one of the issues these uh, studies have brought to light is the problem of biases. That is the problem of the uh, unquestioned and the contingent sociocultural habits that orientate uh, algorithmic calculations. And this topic of the uh, AI bias problem, because as I said, machine learning uh, is now called AI. So the, the so-called AI bias problem really took off in the last few years. And nowadays, there is not a single week without a new publication on the morality or the ethics of AI in order to uh, fight uh, against uh, bias. And so it's even to the point now that there is a whole meta literature that tries to make sense of the whole massivity of the literature on AI bias and on the morality of machine learning. And another clear sign of this uh, impressive high, high one, of this impressive takeoff, uh, another clear sign of that is that there are many uh, white papers that are now being published by uh, corporate actors such as Google or IBM or McKinsey or Microsoft. Uh, white papers that deal specifically with the uh, AI bias problem 
and also with the, um, with the morality and the ethics subtending uh, machine learning algorithms. And of course, this is great in a sense, because it's not every day, when you think about it, it's not every day that a, a topic and an issue uh, developed within the uh, STS, within the uh, science and technology studies, it's not every day that such a topic perfuses the uh, industrial world, because most of the time, nobody cares, actually. Uh, but this time, it's different. Uh, this time, it resonates within the uh, industrial domain. But on the other hand, this success, I would say, of the uh, AI bias problem also subtends the risk of um, an ethics washing. Why is that? Well, because by repeatedly using and reusing the term AI bias, the meaning of the expression uh, somehow loses its uh, specificity. And this progressively allows powerful uh, industrials to take refuge in what I call intellectual vagueness, that is to take refuge in um, fuzzy terms that are not firm enough to sustain uh, binding policies. And this is, according to me, the main problem nowadays, because by repeatedly using the term AI bias problem, we don't really know what we're talking about anymore. And so the, the paper that I'm presenting here uh, tries to uh, provide uh, conceptual tools in order to uh, further refine the notion of bias and uh, make it somewhat more uh, operational. And so this is the whole ambition, if you will, of the presentation and of the paper. So clarifying the notion of bias and using this clarification in order to maybe uh, suggest new ways to uh, comprehend the morality of machine learning algorithms. So it's quite a busy program, but I will try to do that in, in kind of a 30 minutes or so. And say so just quickly uh, regarding the, the plan of the presentation, because uh, I will deal with many different things. So I will first quickly uh, introduce a, a positive view uh, on biases. And uh, I will recall that uh, without biases, there is no statistical learning. And this amounts to, to saying that biases are um, integral parts of, stati of statistical learning. And then I will introduce entities called uh, ground truth, which are um, basically databases where some of the biases required to do machine learning are uh, gathered. And I will introduce also the notion of a ground truth thing which refers to the, to the practices involved in the construction and in the management of ground truth databases. And then I will borrow from, um, so this is the, the wild uh, <laughs> section of the presentation, if you will, because I will borrow um, from uh, pragmatist philosopher William James um, in order to, to talk about the relative, relative morality of these ground truthing practices. And so this will make me propose that maybe uh, ground truthing practices and the many biases they establish, maybe these practices are uh, all the more moral as they imply uh, collective hesitation. And finally, I will build upon, uh, upon all that in order to propose um, very speculative graphs that in the paper I call um, te techno moral graphs. And I will argue that, well, these kind of moral devices could be a way to uh, assess and make visible the, the biases of machine learning algorithms. And therefore, uh, there could be a way to kind of visualize and uh, value the morality of machine learning algorithms. So this is the this is the plan. It's, it's quite a buzzy one, I agree. And um, well, okay. And this is, for example, for example, this is a techno moral graph. And the main goal, the whole goal of the presentation, would be to make this uh, strange thing uh, clear to you. I'm not sure I will manage to do that, but anyway, that's the that's the, the hope. And yes, just, just to do some very quick self-promotion. So the, the paper uh, I'm presenting, it's a kind of sequel to, to, to my book that, that has been released in April uh, by MIT Press. And so actually it's, the, it's a kind of a sequel of the first part of the book that is uh, entitled Ground Truthing. So if you are interested in the topic of the constitution of algorithm, you, uh, you can access the book quite easily because it's an open access. So if you just uh, search constitution of algorithm PDF, you will find the book very easily. So now the self-promotion is over. And yes, let me dive. So let me dive into the, the heart of the, of the matter now. So in order to, as I said, in, in order to uh, refine the notion of bias and then uh, explore new ways of uh, talking about morality or machine learning algorithm, I first have to explain, or I, I first have to recall uh, something that has become quite inaudible uh, outside, the, outside, outside the, the spheres of uh, computer science. And this thing is the following. 
Well, biases are uh, necessary for learning operations. And this is something that has been demonstrated uh, as early as uh, 1980 by an important researcher called uh, Tom Mitchell. And uh, he showed that um, biases understood as external and arbitrary uh, sources of information. So he showed that biases are necessary for the inductive leap underlying uh, any statistical learning process. And so this is the meaning of the first quote you have here. Um, and basically it says that if you don't bias your model, um, all you can do, or if you don't bias your model with an external source of information, all you can do is to list all the instances that you have on your data set. And this very well-known argument has been reassessed more recently by uh, Pedro Domingos, who uh, wrote that, um, well, in ordinary, ordinary life, uh, bias is a pejorative word, preconceived notions are bad. However, in machine learning, preconceived notions are ind indispensable. You can't learn uh, without them. So this is something important to have in mind. Uh, basically, no bias, no, no learning. But still, um, and I'm already starting the second part of the presentation here, but still, uh, it's also important to Im immediately specify that biases are not abstract entities. Um, they are not abstract elements. They are actually real things that you can see and that need to be constructed. And a good way to become uh, sensitive to the materiality of uh, learning biases is, for instance, to, to consider what computer scientists call ground truth data sets. And this is what you can see here for the case of phase detection. So when computer scientists want to develop an algorithm for phase detection, for example, they have to rely on this kind of a database that gathers so-called input data, such as this one here, uh, which is a digital photograph with faces. And most of the time with Caucasian faces, which of course is a very important problem. Um, but computer scientists also need uh, this kind of data here, which in this case are uh, coordinates and the numerical values that indicate where the faces are on the image. And uh, these values are produced by humans, and more and more they are produced by uh, underpaid uh, crowd workers on platforms such as um, Amazon Mechanical Turk or Short Task or whatever. And of course, when you put the image and the coordinate together, you get a ground truth image here. And at that point, as a developer, you have an image and a bias, and therefore you can start to develop uh, an algorithm in order to somehow try to compute this image on the left in order to uh, get results that are close to the labeled image uh, on the right. And it is precisely because the image has been biased that you can start designing a new uh, detection algorithm. And as a consequence, uh, if critical studies of algorithm uh, want to uh, consider the issue of ethics and morality for the case of machine learning, uh, these studies should also include in their reflections the fact that biases are necessary, but also uh, they should include in their, in their um, criticism the fact that these biases are also very often very concrete in the sense that they are expressed, at least in part, in these ground truth databases that precisely uh, gather input data and output targets and thus enable algorithmic learning. And also, uh, very importantly, uh, biases as expressed in ground truth data sets, they are also crucial for machine learning algorithms because they allow them to be evaluated. And here you have a translation of a ground truth that allows uh, performance uh, comparisons between competing algorithms. So all these uh, things here are different algorithms. And these statistical measures are made possible thanks to the external information that bias the algorithms. So in short, a ground truth database such as this one here. So um, this allows the formation of the coordinate system here. And so it is thanks to ground truth databases that researchers can uh, evaluate and can compare bunches of different algorithms according to conventional uh, statistical measures. So in that sense, ground truth are, operate as yardsticks between uh, competing algorithms. And without ground truth, and so without the biases they encapsulate, so without ground truth, you cannot do that. So uh, you cannot evaluate the relative correctness of machine learning algorithms. And this um, precise uh, function of ground truth 
that uh, allow uh, performance uh, evaluations between different machine learning uh, algorithms. This uh, allows me in turn to uh, deal with the tricky topic of unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithm. And so this is a topic that is quite specialized, but I still mention it because I think it's interesting. But the, the typical objection, as soon as one puts forward the centrality of ground truth for machine learning, um, so the, the typical objection is to say, okay, well, yes, this is true, but this is true only for supervised machine learning algorithms, which are algorithms that rely on labels uh, to define their uh, learning uh, operations, to say quickly. Uh, so the typical objection is to say, okay, it's not true for unsupervised or self-supervised machine learning algorithms, because these uh, specific um, and sometimes very advanced uh, algorithms do not need uh, labels to uh, define their learning uh, function. And so this is the classical objection. Um, classical objection, by the way, on which capitalize many uh, current projects around self-supervised uh, learning, which are the last evolution, for example, of deep convolutional neural networks. And, um, but anyway, here you can see an excerpt of a, a recent publication in computer vision that presents a, a new self-supervised video processing uh, machine learning algorithm. And what's interesting, uh, I believe, what's interesting to see uh, is these two uh, elements here in red. So uh, GT flow uh, means a ground truth flow and ours uh, stands for, well, the, the algorithm that is presented in the paper, which, which they call self-flow. And what's interesting to see is that even in this unsupervised case, the algorithm continues to be bound by uh, ground truth. And I mean, all these Sintel, Sintel Finan, and all these things are ground truth. And I chose this, this paper uh, almost randomly but if you browse through the many uh, important conferences around uh, applied uh, computer science, you'll find uh, many such uh, unsupervised algorithms that nonetheless refer to ground truth simply because these algorithms um, still need ground truth. So they don't need ground truth for the definition of the learning function, because that is true, you can keep that. Uh, they don't need any labels to define the learning function, but still they need ground truth in order to uh, attest to their performances. And here you can see one expression of this necessity. And in that sense, unsupervised or self-supervised uh, algorithms remain subordinate to ground truth because they are the only entities that can relate these algorithms to other, competi to other competing algorithms. And so again, uh, so this is not a technical necessity, if you will, because uh, these algorithms, this algorithm, for example, self-flow um, doesn't need any labels to, to define its function. So it's not a technical necessity, but it's a practical imperative, a practical imperative that is linked to the fact that uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithms are not intended to remain theoretical. They are designed to be uh, ultimately used and they are designed to be uh, worked upon. And this imply confronting them to benchmark ground truth data sets in order to, to show their relevance and show their efficiency. And so, um, if ground truth databases basically are not necessary for the definition of these algorithms, uh, they remain essential to make these unsupervised uh, algorithms exist as device producing um, valuable results, basically. And so this is something important to keep in mind. Uh, basically, unsupervised machine learning algorithms are still supervised by ground truth. And so this, uh, this may sound a little, a, a little bit strange, but um, well, at the same time, this is also uh, just very common sense because any computer scientist is aware of that. Um, anyone who tries to dev develop uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithms knows that he or she uh, will have to confront and will have to interact with ground truth databases. And so uh, any, any developer knows that um, he or she is uh, ultimately subordinated to ground truth databases. But still, well, these ground truth databases, of course, they don't exist all by themselves. They need to be constructed. And uh, this uh, required uh, very practical efforts. And here you can see a table that shows uh, some, of the step, some of the steps required uh, to design a ground truth data set, uh, in this case, for uh, image segmentation. And this is taken for, for my book where I uh, follow the computer scientists trying to, to design a new ground truth. And so, of course, computer scientists, they first had to select images. 
but they also uh, somehow uh, had to make people also draw rectangles basically around things. And then they had to create weighted maps um, with a very specific threshold. And then they had to create it, uh, they had to make decisions uh, with regards to the elements to keep within the salient uh, regions here. And then they had to define a way to segment the boundaries here in order to get a very uh, clear cut uh, elements on the last row. And all this was an extremely problematic process. But in the end, these uh, computer scientists could rely on a ground truth, um, could rely on a new ground truth uh, in order to uh, design a new uh, algorithm. And this is why I prefer to talk about the ground truth thing. This is why I use the gerund, because um, the gerund uh, form underlies the fact that the ground truth and, the, and all the biases, uh, ground truth need to be constructed, but also they need to be handled, they need to be managed, and they also need to be maintained. And when you start really digging into these uh, ground truthing processes, when you start to um, kind of account for them quite systematically, as I did uh, and as I continue to do in my uh, research, when you do that, you realize that at least, well, you realize that at some point, uh, these uh, practices kind of gravitate around three uh, dimensions, as I call them. So there is a first dimension, so to speak, that deals with all the problematization practices that aim to uh, establish the terms of a problem that can be solved in a computational way. Because what well, this is obvious only in hindsight, but a problem a machine learning algorithm tries to solve is not a priori given. Such a problem is the result of practices that problematize a state of affair. And so these uh, problematization uh, moments sometimes, uh, for example, entail specific practices such as uh, criticizing previous papers or providing um, reasoned judgments on how things should be organized in society and so on. And another dimension that is crucial during these uh, processes is the work of collecting, uh, compiling, uh, organizing, and cleaning the data to be used for the, for the shaping and, and training of new uh, machine learning algorithms. And this dimension often takes place in parallel to the problematization of the new algorithm project. And finally, there is a third dimension, so to speak, uh, specific to ground truthing practices uh, that is uh, related to all the categories or all the labels that are um, superimposed on the collected uh, raw data. Because uh, these labels, such as uh, these ones here, um, they, of course, they do not pre-exist. Uh, they need to be produced. And this uh, entails, as I said, um, many problematic decisions and many different actors, for example, crowdsourcing companies, called workers, uh, funding institutions, because you need to pay for that, of course, and so on. And so all this to say that as a sociologist and ethnographer of science, when you observe and when you account for these moments where people are constructing and people are manipulating round truth, you can um, classify them uh, in one of these three dimensions that all together kind of delineate the, the space of the ground truthing uh, processes. And so, well, just to summarize perhaps the, the second part of the, of the presentation, which is a bit longer than the first one, obviously. But again, all this is quite trivial um, for computer science practitioners. Um, I mean, well, it still needs to be repeated. That is, uh, machine learning algorithms are uh, attached to ground truthing practices in order to be shaped, published, and applied in real world situations. Because without all these practical efforts to uh, establish biases and uh, ground their efficiency, uh, most machine learning algorithms could not exist and not a single one could be effective, effectively used. And to me, this is something to keep in mind every time we talk about machine learning algorithms. And so now uh, I move to the third part of the presentation, but um, with all these uh, preliminary uh, elements in mind, the, the issue of morality with regards to uh, machine learning uh, may start to become a little bit more concrete uh, because by just including this very small realistic modality, that is machine learning algorithms need uh, constructed and more or less contingent referential biases in order to show their correctness and uh, come into existence. By just including this modality, um, the whole, um, a whole different landscape starts to unfold. That is instead of, for, for instance, 
uh, irresistible ventures that conf confidently insert human cognition into digital devices, which is the usual tale of applied uh, computer science. Um, so instead of that tale, uh, computer science and industry start to appear uh, radically fragile and uh, radically uncertain. Why? Well, because a single change, a single change in the ground truthing practices uh, underlying the shaping of a machine learning algorithm, a single change could be enough to significantly uh, modify the whole consistency of an algorithm. For example, one single change uh, in uh, this process here. So uh, say a different way to ask uh, crowd workers to, to draw rectangles. One single change could, uh, would lead to a different ground truth. And therefore, it would lead, it would lead to, the, to the shaping of a different machine learning algorithm, since they would have to, to build upon and uh, confront uh, a different uh, ground truth. So, um, so just by uh, recalling that uh, ground truthing practices uh, underlying the, the, the shaping and use of machine learning algorithm, uh, one highlights that uh, basically it could be otherwise. And this is a, a very famous uh, STS uh, mantra, if you will. But uh, contrary to, to what some big firms may, uh, tell, uh, may tell us, there is no necessity actually in computer science and industry because one single change one single change during the ground truthing moments, and you end up with a different algorithm. And again, this is something that is trivial for computer science practitioners. Um, I mean, they are usually well aware of that because this is their day-to-day -day work. Uh, they may not say it that way, but uh, what well, they do experience it. And if you have the chance to do ethnographic field work in a, in a computer science laboratory, uh, computer science laboratory whose members try to design new machine learning algorithms, um, you, you may see that what is happening during these uh, ground truthing processes can be summarized like this. That is, uh, well, uh, schematically, um, ground truthing practices use a bunch of usual means to operate, say, uh, usual computer programming languages, website APIs, uh, to scrap data, among many other things, of course. But also, at some point, um, you may see that what was previously considered a simple means start to appear uh, problematic and start to turn into an end in itself. And it could be related to a, to a ground truth data set that is not maintained anymore, for example, or it can be related to a crowdsourcing company that changed uh, its, term, its terms of use. Or it could be many different things, of course. And as a participant observer, as a, as a sociologist of science, you will see that these uh, moments of hesitation entail uh, sometimes collective discussions during seminars, during meetings, during coffee breaks, etc. And most of the time, we will also see that at some point, um, this hesitation ends and the, the matter of concern ends up being considered a means again. And the project then continues to unfold until another means is turned into an end, thus triggering maybe another collective hesitation. But the, the tricky thing is that, well, some labs or some firms may value these moments, whereas uh, other firms or other labs may consider them as useless and may not support their full deployment. So in that sense, some organization may support the eruption of genuine option. So this is the technical term that I borrow from William James, um, but I won't really discuss it. I mean, we can discuss it uh, afterwards, but uh, I won't discuss it here because it would be too long. So some labs may support the um, consideration of alternative options during ground truthing moments, while other labs or other firms may consider them as deleterious. And so these uh, moments of hesitation can be more salient in, in some settings than in others. But still, uh, in the immense uh, majority of cases, at least for uh, applied computer science, but in the immense majority of cases, in the official account of machine learning algorithms will look like this. Uh, so when the uh, algorithm will be presented in a report or will be published in a, in a paper, the whole ground truthing part of the model will most of the time look like a straight line and most hesitation uh, if there were some. So for instance, uh, all hesitations like here, uh, all the moments of um, collective uh, exploration will be washed away. And this is a huge loss, I believe, because if these uh, collective hesitations were accounted for and put forward, um, they would have contributed 
to uh, making the proposed algorithm more uh, moral. So why? Well, because it would attest to the diff all the different options, all the different possible future, uh, well, some of the different possible uh, futures uh, that have been considered during the design phase uh, of the project, if you would. So, in other words, when you consider morality as the experience of doubt and the experience of collective hesitation with regards to uh, alternative options that spark, uh, which, is a, which is a very special way to consider morality, I agree. But if you consider morality this way, which is, I believe, in a pragmatist way, you may start to envision a new criterion to distinguish between uh, morality differentials. And so at that point, in this, always in this pragmatist uh, mindset, uh, morality may look like a, a continuum now, where the more uh, the ground truthing phase of a machine learning project is the product of collective hesitation, the more moral uh, it is. And conversely, the less the ground truthing phase of a machine learning project is the product of collective hesitations, the less moral it is. So in short, the, the notion of alternative option that again, uh, you can document, I mean, as a sociologist of science, you, you can sometimes observe these moments of hesitation in computer science laboratories. So these moments of uh, this notion of uh, alternative option may allow to almost uh, count the number of collective hesitations that contribute to the ground truthing moments of um, one uh, machine learning project. And so uh, from here, moving to the fourth part, so from here, if we um, come back to the elements related to uh, ground truthing that, that uh, I talked about in the second part of the presentation. So if we consider, once again, this graph that uh, specifies the, the, the three dimensions of ground truthing practices, parameterization, databasing, and labeling. So if we include, include the somewhat speculative elements of moral philosophy uh, I have just uh, talked about, so if we combine all this, uh, each axis of this uh, three-dimensional uh, ground truthing space becomes staggered by potential alternative options that themselves refer to potential explorative and collective hesitations between uh, means and ends. So here, e each intersection between one line and one axis uh, corresponds to a potential alternative option that is, co that is collectively considered during the deployment of, well, problematization, databasing, or labeling. And so from there, the, the theoretical space of uh, ground truthing practices becomes, uh, it becomes a visual and a conceptual space on which specific uh, courses of actions can eventually be reported in the sense that, well, th this um, scriptural technology, even though, even though it is very rudimentary, but still this kind of scriptural technology could then support uh, maps and uh, maps that differentiate uh, machine learning projects with regard to their uh, ground truthing practices. And so these uh, technomoral graphs, as I call them, so there will be a way to um, visualize uh, part of the narrative of the ground truthing practices that contributed to, uh, to a machine learning project. So this figure here is a technomoral graph of three hypothetical machine learning projects, alpha, beta, and uh, gamma. And um, let's say that, uh, well, if by convention, each encounter with an alternative option, that is um, each collective hesitation between a means and an end. Uh, if each of these like, encounter count as one, as one, the addition of these uh, attested explorations allows to report a value on one, on the, uh, on one of these uh, three uh, axes here, problematization, databasing, and labeling. And so the, the, the pragmatist morality of each machine learning project as far as its uh, ground truthing practices are concerned, because I only, I'm only talking about ground truthing practices here, I'm not talking about anything else. So um, as far as uh, its ground truthing practices are concerned, uh, it could be summarized by its more or less extended map on this coordinate system. So the more uh, accounted and the more available explorative hesitation uh, on each of the axes, the more morality, if you will. And so these technomoral graphs, which are completely speculative, of course, um, well, I told you it was a high level um, talk anyway, but they are completely speculative. But these graphs, nonetheless, they would, they would have no value by themselves. Uh, they could only make sense if they point 
to already existing documents and already existing reports accounting precisely for the collective investigations and uh, alternative options. So this kind of scriptural device, which are very speculative, um, they may operate as a kind of reflexive instrument whose main uh, aim would be to, to make explicit and uh, compare some of the constitutive biases of uh, machine learning algorithms. And so I will just finish on that, but all this may look a, a little bit silly, but um, it could be, I believe, a, a pretty nice way to um, further value and further uh, put forward the uh, hesitations that may occur during ground truthing processes. And thus during these moments where many biases are uh, necessarily uh, established. Because for now, these uh, hesitant explorations, such as the one, the, such as the ones here, so um, these moments of hesitation, uh, these moments of fragility, because it's, it's all about stressing the, the fragility of machine learning algorithms, because for now, these uh, moments uh, of fragility are simply washed away in the final uh, official accounts, like here. So the final accounts on new machine learning algorithms usually, usually are extremely confident and they are extremely uh, upomoral uh, in that sense here. And so, um, yes, if in, in con well, if you will, in conjunction with the development of machine learning related projects, if technomoral graphs uh, were also required, let's imagine that. Uh, so the, the biases that are again the constitutive of machine learning algorithms uh, may uh, finally start to be assessed instead of being systematically uh, repressed, because this is the current situation now. In the majority of cases, the the constitutive fragilities of machine learning algorithms are uh, repressed because otherwise they cannot be published and they cannot circulate and they cannot exist. So this is the current situation. And this is why I try to kind of imagine new moral devices to try to uh, to bypass the, the current uh, impasse. All right, I will stop here. Thank you for your attention.